Hey everyone, um, I'm Betty Mayo. My pronouns are she and they. Um, and I am here because, well, because I helped on <laughs> the Excluded documentary. Um, as soon as I met like Sarah and Jack, I was completely enthralled with like the work that they were doing. And um, really, really was excited to be a part of it. I'm also a huge, huge advocate for co-production. Um, I work at the Advocacy Academy now, which is a youth social justice movement in South London where we train young people on like social justice and campaigning um, and how to really like tackle the issues that like impact you. And so I'm all about like nothing about us without us and making sure that like the people making the change and the decisions to make change are the people who face the issues that they're trying to solve. Um, because yeah, nobody is like more of an expert on these issues than the people facing them. And so I feel like hugely passionate about this and really excited to be here. Um, I'm Laura Lundy and, and Sarah's introduced me really. I'm an academic, I'm a professor in Belfast and in Cork. Um, a lot of my work is, uh, all of it is child rights, um, but a lot of it is child and youth participation. I have a model participation that some of you know, the Lundy model, it's very well used. Um, I was involved in a really, I am involved in a very big project on school exclusion in the UK that's led by Oxford, but involves Edinburgh and Cardiff and ourselves. And then I saw the Excluded Lives, um, fil the Excluded film being advertised on Twitter and watched it, was blown away, found out who, who did this, you know? And then we had a, a phone call conversation. And as I was talking to Sarah on the phone one day, lying in my bed for some reason, but I know where I was, <laughs> and I was talking to her, because we have a phone. And I thought, She's just being completely rights compliant without ever really intending. It's just like a perfect example of how you should do something like this. And then we got connected. That was me. Yeah. Olivia? Hi, uh, um, I'm Olivia. I am a trustee for the Scottish Youth Parliament. Um, and I'm here because SYP was involved in the creation of the documentary. Um, they interviewed two of our former trustees who unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, about kind of our views on school exclusion, we take very much a rights-based approach to um, all of our work, really. Um, particularly, we pay attention to Article 12, which is the right of young people having their voice heard. Um, and so, yeah, I'm very excited to be having this conversation. I watched the documentary and was also blown away by it. Um, it was on a topic that... I don't really know um, too much about prior to watching the documentary um, and that the Scottish Youth Parliament hasn't done loads of work on, um, but co-production is massive to us, the amount of projects that we have going on right now, particularly with kind of outside organisations, um, really have co-production at their heart. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Hi, I'm Juliet Harris. I'm director of Together, the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. Um, Together is a membership organisation of over 500 um, children's organisations, but also academics and interested professionals. Um, and it's really our vision that all children and young people in Scotland have all of their rights respected all of the time. Um, and I know from watching the film and from all of my work that we're a long way from achieving that vision at the moment. Um, through our membership, we work really closely with children and young people to raise awareness and understanding of some of the um, breaches of their rights that they experience in everyday life. Um, and at the moment, we're doing everything that we can to actually get these breaches recognised by the international community. So tomorrow is an exciting day that it's the, the UN Universal Periodic Review, when lots of other countries review how well Scotland and the rest of the UK is actually doing in taking forward children's rights. And we are hoping for a recommendation from one of the other countries of the world around school exclusions, um, because it's so important that we use that kind of power of the international community to influence what happens here in Scotland, and that we use the power of children and young people's voices here in Scotland to tell the international community what we need help with and where we need recommendations. So yeah, like, all my other panellists, really impressed by the film. It's, it's an incredible piece of work. And it's pieces of work like this that provide us with the evidence and the power that we need to get that scrutiny of our human rights record and to make sure that things actually do change for all children and young people here in Scotland. So we've got a good amount of time today. Um, 
it's a bit like question time. Like I say, we're going to have the questions, the panel are going to talk about it. What's not like question time is that there will be a coffee break and there will be hopefully biscuits. Uh, and at the end of both panels, um, we're going to have a wine reception like before we um, screen the film. So, yeah. I'm just going to do the little running around to put the first question up. So, yeah, a really basic question, I guess. But why should we do co-production? Hmm, be careful what we say here. There's young people on the boards. <laughs> um, does anyone want to speak to this in particular? <laughs> trying to pass it to Betty. Um, I, I don't use the term co-production because, you know, I think it's a lot of people do and it's a really important term. But I think the way we look at it, the way I look at it, a lot of people do is, you know, entitlement and a right that if you see it, that actually young people are entitled to be influenced, the decisions that are made about them, then you, it, it's just automatically you have to do it with them. And as that's what you were saying at the start, Betty. And then the question is then how do you do that really well? And that means you do it early and you do it all the way through and you follow through. And that's, you know, we do it because young people are entitled to have it. That's, that's my Yeah, I agree. I also think that, um, that like, we should do co-production because we should just believe that like young people know. And I think that we should believe that like, I think there's like there's co-production with young people, but as I was saying, just like co-production with like with all people who are like marginalized from decision making, marginalized from like being at the table, having a seat at the table. Um, and I think that like it just comes from a belief that like ordinary people just don't know um, like how to solve like ordinary issues. And I think it's just not true. Um, and so we should co-produce to actually just like shake the tables up a bit. That like let's rethink like this system isn't working. Um, the answers we've already got aren't working. They clearly aren't right. Um, I don't think the answers lie in who's sitting at the table right now. Um, as we should co-produce to like maybe get the right ones, ones like from people who are in the community facing these issues. Um, and I think that like that is the case for young people as well. That there's a lot of like belief that young people don't know, and we do. Um, yeah, so at SYP, we kind of commonly refer to co-production as meaningful participation. Um, something that our chair said to me the other day, which I keep quoting, um, Sophie, she said that people are always going on about how young people are the future and they kind of forget that we are right here, uh, right now. Um, and they, they, it's just there are so many services right now which are failing young people. Um, and that is because they don't have young people at the heart of them. Young people aren't designing them. They aren't um, brought into the process. And like you said, co-production, when it is done well, it involves young people from the start throughout and then afterwards. So it closes that feedback loop and then we can continue to improve. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, like my other panelists, I don't tend to talk about co-production we talk about it in terms of Article 12 of the UNCRC and we see it as a right. Um, and importantly, it's the right of all children and young people from birth right up to the age of 18 under the UNCRC. Um, and so I know from the work that we do around Article 12 that we do it because it makes children and young people's lives better, but it makes the lives of communities, families, it makes everybody's lives better. Um, because everybody has the right to have an equal say in the way that their communities are and the way that um, they experience their communities. I think a good example of this is um, a piece of work that the Children's Parliament did in East Lothian, um, where they spoke to children, um, at primary school age children, about what they liked about their town, but also what they didn't like about the town and how it could be improved. Um, and I think if they'd have spoken to the adults, the adults might have said, oh, we need a playground. We need some swings, perhaps. Um, children like swings. Um, and maybe, maybe we need some more parking spaces so that we can drive our children to school. Um, I'm assuming that's what adults would say. I'm maybe being a little bit stereotypical there. But instead, by speaking to children, what do you want Trinent to be like? What do you see it being like? They said, we want more green space. We want vegetable stores. There's nowhere to buy vegetables in Trinent. Um, and all the vegetables that we buy from an unnamed supermarket are all out of date and horrible. 
Um, we want to see more flowers. We want to see more green space. So don't build playgrounds on our green space. Create green space that we can play on and do what we want. We want to see more flowers. Um, we want Trinent to be a place that we're proud and that we're excited to walk around and that we think is pretty. We want a rocket train because it takes too long to get to Edinburgh. Um, but by talking to children and young people, they drew a great big mural of what Trinent used to be like, what Trinent is like now, and what Trinent will look like in the future. They were able to work with these children to actually create a Trinent where these children were proud, and they did like walking around, and they did like to be there to grow up. So since doing that consultation, there are more flowers in Trinent. Um, they've actually won an award. It's like a Scotland in Bloom award or something like that. Um, that. So there are more flowers in the street. They've set up a farmer's market so that there, are, um, there is a possibility of getting um, fresh vegetables. Um, the children and young people um, have really kind of established themselves as people who've got their own opinions, their own voices. And now the local council listen to children in Trinent and listen to them about how they want the town to be. And so this is an example of where actually through co-production, through really respecting the rights of children to be heard, Trinent is a nicer place for children to grow up in, but it's a nicer place for families. And there's that real value put on what children think and what children have to say. And it's, it's a better town as a result. Yeah, sorry, just off the back of that, like, it's so true that when we involve young people in the process, it gives those decisions so much more legitimacy. At SYP, we're completely youth-led, so, sorry, I'm looking at our MSY views in the audience. Um, so, you know, our decisions are made by young people for young people, and we find that people listen to us because of that, um, and it just enhances the level of debate so much more. We hear so many more viewpoints. Um, and so, sorry, Trinent is in my constituency. And it's so true, you can see the difference. There's so many more flowers, there's so many more people moving out there now, um, and that is because we involved young people. Okay, can you recount positive experiences of, exp of engaging with large groups of especially mainstream children? And I, I do want to sort of say, like, because most of these questions came from the audience, um, we haven't obviously put the names of the people, but if this is your question and you want to jump in because you had a particular thing that you wanted to find out or a particular angle that you wanted to hear the panel discuss, please do. I guess, like, this, when I see this question, obviously, like, um, I'm 23, so, like, technically, I'm still a young person for a bit. <laughs> um, and so, like, as a young person, I can talk about what it's been like to be engaged with. Um, and I think that, like, my first experience of that, like, was with the Advocacy Academy. Um, we're based in Brixton, and um, they... They work with 17 to 19 year olds who are like deemed as like marginalized young people with a bit of oppression, like usually poor, black or brown, queer, um, like struggling in school, basically angry at the world around them, knowing that like actually life isn't fair and I don't think it's my fault. Um, and I think that like we were given a space where we were just like, we were told that it was okay to be angry, and that like, it's not okay that you're that you're made to be angry, but like your anger is is like your power, and it's like it's what's gonna like carry you through. And I think that like coming from schools and an education system that like the slightest glimpse of anger like punishes it, which is like so tied to school exclusions. And like I don't have um, experience with school exclusions myself, but I think that's a lot to do with the fact that like my whiteness, that like in school like my my gender is still deemed as like a nurturing and sweet gender. So like when I'm angry, I'm just like sassy and probably a bit bitchy, but like not actually like a threat. Um, whereas, like, my, my, uh, friends, like, black boys, like, excluded from the moment they open their mouth, and, like, those friends, like, have been in prison since then, and I think that, like, actually, that's because we're not given spaces that, like, allow us to be angry, that tell us that, like, actually, yeah, the world isn't fair, and it's not right, um, and instead, like, we're punished for those emotions, and I think that, like, being in a space that, that engaged us um, and told us that like that 
that we are powerful and that we can make change. And like actually we went on to make change and like we did the um we did the action on like education or exclusion in the school to prison pipeline and like we were angry and we were shouting from the rooftops about this and like to be given that space to just be allowed to like to be angry um is a really really powerful it's a really, really powerful place to be in. Like, as you see, like, I haven't left it. <laughs> um, can you speak a little bit about how far that, that you know, campaign got, like, where it got to? I mean, I know we do cover it in the film, so, but some people might not be able to stay around and watch the film, so I... Yeah. So, um, basically, we made, like, uh, so, like, in, like, a tube map, even here, in, like, the, the subway has, like, the, the roots on the tube... Um, so we did. We made our own map that we stuck over a map on the tube in London on the Northern Line, and we made it so like the first stop was kind of like you go to nursery, and then maybe like you you get told off, then you're put in isolation, then you're excluded, then you're permanently excluded, and then you're like um, unemployed, and then you go to prison, and it's like this school to prison pipeline. Like rather than going from Brixton to Morden, you go from like school to prison. Um, and that was a little offshoot of that map that actually, what would it look like if we had like compassionate education? What would it look like if like these bad kids were actually just seen as children who'd probably just traumatize, probably hurt, um, have like some feelings and some, um, some needs that aren't being met in school? And what if those needs were met and people were just seen as um, humans? Um, and like that had a nice ending, but actually we don't have that yet. That line was temporarily closed because that's just not the way that like our system's set up now. Um, and so we we stuck this over like the tube maps at like 11 p.m. Um, one night, and actually it was the night before GCSE results day. And so we said, okay, as we celebrate like all these kids that like have got their GCSEs, congratulations. But we what we care about are the young people who like 99% of young people that get excluded um, don't get A stars. Like don't get I'm um, sorry five GCSEs that are C to A star. You just don't. Only one percent of like young people excluded from the age of seven are gonna get five GCSEs that A's are to see. Um, and so we said, we care about these young people today. And we took pictures of these maps and we sent them to like all our friends on um, Twitter. And we said, okay, even if you didn't see it this morning, please can you just tweet saying that you saw this picture and like, and that you're so angry and blah, blah, blah. And, and they did. And it just like, it blew up on Twitter. And Robert Hawthorne, the chair of the Education Select Committee, saw it on Twitter and was like, I want to meet these young people. And so we did. We got into Parliament. But like, it turns out the Tories don't really give a fuck. <laughs> and so, yeah, that wasn't... Like, not much happened there. But like, we got into Parliament, right? We got into these rooms. And that is like from a really creative action. And like, having connections on like social media. And like, sadly, like, lockdown happens. And sadly, the Tories are in power and whatever. Um, but yeah, like what good has come from it is that like Sarah found out about us. This amazing documentary was made like by young people. It's like just got youth voices in it. It's completely led by like voices of like young people who, who have been excluded and, ha and have all the answers. Like I really hope if you don't see it today, like see it soon because like the young people in that absolutely have the answers. They know it's not their fault. Um, and yeah, so that's that bit about the campaign. Um, who else would like to talk about being involved in young people. Yeah. Um, so at SYP, obviously, we revolve around engaging young people. Um, it's at the heart of everything we do. So if you don't know how we work, we basically have um, MSYPs, which kind of reflect the MSPs in the Scottish Parliament. So we've got the same constituencies. Um, and then we come together and we campaign on certain issues. We have two sittings every year where we vote on policy that MSYPs themselves put forward and then we can campaign on this. Um, and we have had so many instances of success through engaging these young people. Um, we have had campaigns that have been really successful. So we campaigned on equal marriage way back when. Um, we campaigned on free bus travel. Um, we're currently campaigning on things like fast fashion, which is like my bread and butter. Um, but there's other wee projects we run as well. There's the mental health investigation team currently ongoing, which is um, where our MSYPs are kind of reviewing local mental health services. We meet with the SQA once a month to tell them about our issues with the exam system. There are many. Um, and 
all of these projects we run, all of these campaigns have young people at their centre and that is why they are successful and that is why people take them seriously because it's so unique. There's no one else really like us in the world who have the same structure, the same youth-led structure and who operate in the same way and that makes us really special. Um, not to like hype us up or anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, and we've... Um, one of our most recent ones was um, we engaged with Liam MacArthur, MSP, who um, was putting forward the assisted dying bill. Um, I won't go too much in depth into what that is about, but we made sure that in that consultation, young people were involved. Um, and then we got to go to the bill launch and it was really exciting. And it was just so nice to see kind of the product of our efforts um, and how that young people were included from start to finish. Because when young people are included from start to finish, most of the time, like the project is successful or the campaign is successful. And you can really see the impact that we have. I completely agree with that and I would say the Scottish Youth Parliament is incredibly special um, and they've, they've changed Scotland for the better. It's another example where I talked about Trenent before, which is just a, just a town, an important town, but just a town, whereas SYP has changed all of Scotland. And I think a real example of that is around the campaign for UNCLC incorporation um, because I honestly don't think we'd be in this position we are where soon, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, rights will be binding, children and young people's rights will be binding in law in Scotland. And that, again, was so led by SYP. Um, I remember meeting um, a former chair of SYP, came along to seminars that we had way back in 2017, um, learning about the UNCLC at that time. And she, she, was, she met Laura um, and was... Um, completely captured by the idea and the power of incorporation of making rights binding in law. Um, and I know, I think it was that same year, SYP in its manifesto, where they did a consultation with 70,000 children and young people to find out what their priorities were. And one of the top priorities was make our rights binding in law. And that kind of evidence, how can government argue with it? 70,000 children and young people say, we want our rights to be made binding in law. I mean, government can argue with it. They probably did argue with it. They dragged their feet a little bit. But SYP did not give up, and they carried on that campaign. They worked really strongly with us at Together, with the Commissioner's Office, with the Children's Parliament. And we had an incredible march um, down the Royal Mile um, to the Scottish Parliament on Universal Children's Day. We were joined by a member of the UN Committee. So this just shows the power. If it was lots of adults marching down the Royal Mile, there's no way that somebody would have come over from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child to march with us. It was because children and young people were leading those calls and pushing those calls to get rights made binding in law. And again, it was the nerve and I guess the anger of a young person standing up in the Scottish Parliament and challenging Nicola Sturgeon, because for a long time, Scottish government had said, yes, you know, we'll incorporate at some point in the future, maybe somehow some kind of model, a little bit vague. Um, and um, Ryan McShane, a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament, got the opportunity to stand up in the Scottish Youth Parliament. It was to celebrate, I think it was it's either Human Rights Day or Universal Children's Day. And unscripted, he put Nicola Sturgeon on the spot and said, I challenge you to incorporate the UNCRC into law by the end of this parliamentary term. And what can you do if you've got a young person standing in front of you in parliament? What can you do? You have to keep that kind of promise. And so this is why I fundamentally believe in co-production, the right of children and young people to be heard, the power of the Scottish Youth Parliament of children of young people in Scotland, because it's through their work, once the bill does go through, once we sort out the constitutional wranglings, that children's rights will be binding in law in Scotland. And this includes the right to express a view and to have those views taken seriously. So what a legacy is that, that we actually have in law, or we will have in law, that right to be heard. And it's down to young people, so well done. Yeah, <laughs> how do you follow this? Um, I suppose this is my, my day job. A lot of it is talking to lots of young people in the research that we do. But um, Juliet mentioned the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And I think one of the things that I, I think I am proud of over the past um, decade is I've done a lot of work with the committee itself, trying to make it better. 
at talking to children and young people because when I first started working with them, they weren't talking. And I was saying, well, actually, you know, you're not modeling good practice. And this brings me to the, the one example I want to give you because Juliet used it yesterday, so it's in my head, is that um, they write this guidance for world governments um, every couple of years. And I was saying, like, you write this guidance and you never consult children. You've really got to consult children before you produce what are called general comments. And they, what, they nodded and they nodded. And then they came back and said, right, we're going to do it. Help us. And I was like, well, what, what's your general comment on? And they said, public budgeting. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like, who wants to go out there? You know, it could have been in the digital environment. It could have been in so many exciting topics. And they went spending budgets. And I thought, and then my heart sank. And actually then we then, but I thought, no, it has to be done. And we went out and we, we worked with the international um, children's organizations and we did a global consultation on how governments spend money. And it was eye-opening because of course, children and young people had tons to say about that and tons to say about the process and tons to say about you know efficiency waste involving them, how to do it. And we did a brilliant consultation with young people that informed the general comment that now informs governments. But just because you mentioned it and brought it back in my head, things kind of go in circles. And a couple of weeks ago, I got a, an email from the Finnish government. And they said, way back in 2019, Finnish children filled in your survey and we are the Ministry for Finance. And we thought it was really, really good. And we want to run your survey again. Oh, sorry, that was this last year. They said that. The last week, they told us what had happened. So they ran this consultation. And they're now, and I said, well, what are you doing? And we had this call with them with Child Rights Connect. And they are running this every year and they're helping it to set, using the information to set priority in budgeting. So for example, we all think Finland's brilliant in education. Everyone knows that, yeah? But Finnish children were saying things like they get complete free school meals at all levels in all schools. But the young people were saying, your food is rubbish. You know, your food's terrible. You need more money to get better food. So, and so they're saying, we're now looking at the budget that's allocated to lunches. So there was that. And I'm, Florence is here. That, if, are you in Florence? Is it, is it, we're allowed to bring people in, aren't we? Because <laughs> that was the part. Sorry for putting you on the spot. But you were looking at these kind of fallouts in that particular research project. I learned a lot about how important it is to involve children and young people in spending decision making. And then we were asked by BBC Children in Need in a particular program, the Million and Me program, how could they involve children more in deciding where money goes? And we did a pilot project here in Scotland. So is that okay, Florence, to bring you in? Because this all flows from that one thing. Would you like to say something about that? I'll have to channel Paddy Sloan, who's the <laughs> program director for it, but I'll, I'll try and do her, ju uh, do her justice. Um, we had the Million and Me squad. I think we called it the Million and Me consultation yeah, group, right. but the children wanted it called a squad. That was fine. And the thing that I hold from it was that papers and documents and guidance was all produced, given to the children. And the question they asked was, who speaks like that? And we had to put up our hands and say, we do. And it made no sense to anyone. So the whole thing had to be rewritten. And we talk about it making sense to children, but it made better sense to us as adults as well. It was easier to communicate. It was much clearer. There was no jargon to get us caught up in. And what we've done is we've used that as part of our grant making. Um, we've just launched a new strategy and we're hoping to build more of that into it. But the voices of the children we were trying to capture as part of that process and a top 10 list that they came out of, which was what they would look for from a project, not a funding application, but what was the end point that would make a difference to them. So that's what we've tried to capture. I'm sure Paddy would have an awful lot more to say than that, but, but oh, thanks, I think Flo hopefully that's helped. Thanks, Flo. I just wanted to show you an example of a big consultation that affects national yeah. policy, affects funding. I think, Betty, do you want to talk about your funding thing? I think that's a really good example. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm also, uh, I'm a young consultant for Esme Fairbairn, which is like a big philanthropy foundation. Um, and they give away like 45 million pounds um, a year to like charities in the UK. And they started something called the Involving Young People Collective, which um, I've been a part of for like three years now. And um, when we first started, they were like, okay, I don't know what this is or what you're going to do, but like, we want you to like, let us know what you think about like who we fund and how we should fund them. And like the, it was like so open and we, we've all never really been part of like big, big co-production programs like that. So we're like, okay, I actually have no idea. We didn't even know what like funding was. Um, and so there was a little bit like of training that was needed. That's really important. Um, 
But from that, we were able to run like whole big projects on things that we were interested in. So like, we were like, we want to see the big investment. Like we want to see your endowment. Like where does that money go? And we want to see actually like, who are you funding for the environmental sector? That looks quite white. Like I want to like diversify that a bit. Um, have you got any money to give us support that like we can run our own um, fund? And so at the moment, like we're building a uh, participatory fund, which I think, yeah, we're going to have like some participatory like factors to it. It's quite hard to make it like quite a purist pot, but it's like it's going to be ran by young people um, who have experience of like co-production and we're going to be giving money to organizations who want to involve young people in their governance of the um, organizations. And we want to make sure that like we are like building as many opportunities for, like young people to like get foots on the door, like get onto the table, but also just like bring innovation and excitement and energy into organizations that like are very traditional and keep on just doing things just like because, because this is how we've always done it. Um, I just don't believe in how we've always done it. Um, so yeah, that's really exciting. I really love co-production, can you tell? <laughs> okay, so. There's only two people really in the room with microphones who can talk about this, so it looks like I'm going hey. to be talking a bit. Maybe I should come on stage. Um, can anyone talk about the experience of the co-production processes on the excluded dot, dot, dot? This is where, obviously, I was creating a second PowerPoint because I left my other one at home. So that film is obviously the last word um, at the end there. So who wants to go first? You. Okay. You, yeah, you started it. So you, I, I've talked a little bit about how the film was kind of like put together and about my expectations about how it was going to go. Um, and I mentioned the film that we made with the um, EHRC. Let me remember what this is. The Equalities and Human Rights Commission commissioned me to make a little film called Fair Play, which is kind of cute. And um, But what I did with that, my background's performance and I've done a lot of devised performance and this is where you get in a room and you don't have a script and you all come up with a performance and that's how that's what I brought a lot into into this role um, and so when we first did that film Fair Play um, a lot of people in the background at, uh, at Rights Info which is what we were called at the time um, were suggesting that we try and take the children we were like well we know what we want them to say um, so let's take them on that trip and I was like, oh, it doesn't sound like the best idea, but, um, but okay. And so the very first day of filming, that's what me and Jack did. And, and I think Mike was there as well. And it was really depressing because it just was, you know, trying to sort of like force these things through a particular hoop. And we had like filming planned for um, the rest of the week. We did some in Glasgow. Me and Jack did a day trip to Glasgow. It can be done. I wouldn't, and I wouldn't advocate it after a day's of filming to London. Um, but what we did instead is that we got questions. So we had some questions all about human rights and then we gave them to the children. And these were children between seven and 10. And so that film had this, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't kind of like you know, getting the children involved from the get-go, but it, it involved them. They could make choices about what they wanted to have conversations about, um, and, and they chose the questions that they were interested in. Um, so that's already something that was in the background. And so when we started the filming and I met Betty, and um, Betty said, I want to get involved... And I was like, okay, this is like really interesting. And we also worked with a filmmaker called Anna Merrifield. And Anna had been trained in doing co-production with communities. And so she came on and she did some filming in London. And then we decided to start workshopping. So instead of kind of like just... Because we were saying things like, um, how do you want to be represented? And people were like, we don't know what you mean. Like, you know, we don't actually know what you mean by that. Or what, what do you mean by that? So... Um, we were like, we have to kind of like unpack a lot of this stuff and we, and we need to do it in kind of like quite a process-based way. So we had a workshop online because that was the immediately COVID had kind of struck. And we showed, um, everybody had the rushes of the filming that we'd already done in a, 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 P, a PRU, um, a pupil referral unit. So we'd done some filming already and we showed um, that film and, and then we said, what do you think? What should we be doing next? Who should we be talking to? What would you like to see? And we just took it from there, really. And from that first kind of like conversation, people were saying, 
um, well, you know, because we, we filmed Betty and some of your friends in, in, in Brixton, and a lot of people were saying, actually, quite a few of this group don't actually have experience of exclusion. So we are kind of like exclusion adjacent, but we haven't had it. So you need more people in this film who've experienced exclusion. And we'll help you find them. We know people, like, we're going we're gonna to kind of, like, put you in touch with people that would like to be in it. Um, and we want, we want music and we want poetry and we think we should have some poetry from people who you interview. Um, so, like, it was... We, we, we kind of, like, engaged people, but we also, you know, we weren't saying to them, how would you like us to find the funding for this? Do you know what I mean? We kind of, like, tailored the engagement that we had, um, but at all points, people could get more involved. Do you know what I mean? Like, we, we probably annoyed them, to be honest. Like, you know, after the film had been finished, we kept saying, um, what would you like us to do with this? And you could just tell people, like, oh, we don't want to know anymore. Like, we've done it, and that was the limit of our kind of, like, engagement. Leave us alone. Um, you know, so there is that, there is an interest there around how much you bring people in and how long for, and, uh, you know, how much you think about that. And... I'm somebody who feels like every single project, even if it goes wrong, is something, you know, everything's a learning opportunity. And that we, you know, at each other afterwards, we always have a wash up. And so what's really interesting about this is that this project has been going for an awfully long time. Um, you know, like we didn't get funding. It was a, it was, you know, and, and we had to do it around the back of other things. So it would be eked out and have to stop and start again. But we're constantly still learning now. Like, this hasn't stopped, um, you know. Yeah, no. Um, it's, it's really interesting, like, the... I didn't really know, like, what co-production was. I didn't really know, like, that's what I was doing by saying I wanted to work with, like, each other. The, um, for me, like, I was just being interviewed about the, uh, the action that, that like, happened. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, you're a human rights charity? Like, yeah, yeah, I love human rights. And, like, it's, and it's funny because, actually, I didn't really know what human rights were. Like, if you asked me what they were, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But I just knew that, like, okay, this is kind of adjacent to what I care about. It kind of sounds social justice-y. Um, and it's like, this is what I want to be working in. And you care about exclusions. Like, you're so my peoples. Um, and so... And so that like, I was brought in to like, do some research and um, I was like, yeah, like, I'm really working. I was in the office, like I was set up on my like, Trudeau deck. And Trello, yeah, I got her <laughs> onto Trello. I'm obsessed about Trello. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think that like, it kind of links to um, like, another question. It's like, what does it feel like to, to really be in that like, co-production done well? And I think for me, it just feels like you're working. Like you are, you're doing the work. Um, and like, yeah, there's, there should be a focus on like fun and celebration and there should be like um, space for you to be energized and passionate and all these things. But like actually like you should just kind of be working. You kind of just should be doing the job that like is being given to you and you should feel like it's like it's going somewhere. And like that's what it felt like for me. I was like, oh yeah, but like I'm just, I'm just working. Um, and we did, I mean, you know, so you're using the word work, right? And I mean, when you're working in charities, an awful lot of the time, people are constantly asked to do things for free. And it's just something that I'm so resistant about. You know, we, we've had moments where, our, you know, various people in the organisation are like, well, can't you get people to do some animation for free? Or can't you get people to do this for free? And it's like, no, we should be absolutely paying people for what they're doing. And like, my hesitation when Betty first wanted to get involved was absolutely because of that. Like, I could see that Betty was going to be amazing. That wasn't the point. The point was, is I didn't want Betty to get used to being asked to do things for free. Um, and so the minute we got funding, we started paying people. Um, and that is not without its own complications. Um, you know, like, if you, free, if you pay kind of like young people kind of like, you know, a wage, who's paying tax? How does it work? Where's, you know, like, how does it affect, especially um, people from, um, you know, um, marginalised backgrounds, is it affecting their, you know, different kinds of, like, benefits? Like, there's lots of questions around this, and I've been involved with um, the Human Rights Consortium in Scotland recently talking about that. Um, but the minute we got it, we started paying people for their time. So they came, they did a day rate, we paid everybody London living wage, no matter where they were in the country, and people, even, even the Scottish um, young people that we sent... Um, audio, um, you know, equipment too, so they could capture. We paid them for their time. They told us how many days they worked. We made sure that we paid them. If they came to a workshop, we paid them, you know. And so, absolutely, it's about feeling like you're part of the work, but then the work has to recognise that, you know, you're not, you're not getting this stuff for free. You, sh you should be um, ensuring that people are paid exactly like anybody else is paid. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that, like... Um 
with the work that I do now, which is like, yeah, partially like being like a professional young person, like being in um, spaces as like a young consultant, but also now thinking about like, what would it mean to like, uh, like consult for other organizations wanting to do this work and like what it means to coordinate that like it would always be I would always be a proponent of like definitely paying young people like I'm very anti that but also I think that like like you're very transparent it's like this is a small organization actually we just don't have the funds it's not like I'm not it's not like I've got it here and I'm holding it and you're not getting it <laughs> um and like I felt like very grateful that I was able to make that decision for myself um in that and like I really wanted to um and I think that yeah, I think that it's funny because like as um, Sarah was saying that like when you're involving young people, like we're not really gonna want to do everything. Sometimes you're gonna ask us questions like, what should we do next? And we're like, I don't know. But like actually, it's really great. Like just having that invitation to be a part of that conversation. I think that like that what it requires from organisations is just like effort. It's just like constantly having that door open and poking your head and being like, yeah, do you want to do this? Do you want to come here? Do you want to do that? Do you want to do that? And like maybe young people will come for like thirty percent of that. But like what a young person isn't going to do is like come and knock on the door and be like, please can I come here? Please can I do this? And I think the organisations are waiting for young people to be like, yeah, I want to do this. And I know organisations have said to me like. Oh yeah, if we'd known that all young people want to do that, like yeah, of course we would have. Like, there's loads of space for that. But actually, we're not taught to advocate for ourselves. We're not taught how to like. We're not taught that there are spaces available for us. We're not taught that there's money there available for young people. Um, and I think that like it's that constant effort of like reaching out, making sure that people are aware of like that there are conversations that people can be a part of. Um, and yeah, it's like the effort of organisations, and then like the young people can decide whether they are interested in that or not. <laughs> Maybe have something better to do, but like most of the time, no. Like young people want to be in there. Yeah. I should definitely have worn trainers today. Okay, how involved do you think you need to be before something can be thought of as co-produced? What's the minimal level of engagement? Um, I mean, co-production, it can be quite a vague concept in many ways. It's, you know, there's no way of really measuring it. But for me, if you want something to be truly co-produced, young people need to be engaged from the beginning to the end and throughout. Um, and they need to be involved afterwards as well, getting the feedback, whether that's feedback on the project that they've worked on, where it's going, or if it's feedback on their actual participation, or it's feedback on the people who brought them into it. Um, and it's so important for, you know, these decision makers who are engaging the young people not to make assumptions like what you were saying. It shouldn't be our responsibility to engage ourselves. People need to reach out to us because that's the only way our voices can truly be heard. Um, and, you know, you need to consider all of the barriers that could come with meaningful participation or co-production. One of the things that SYP is kind of working on right now is some guidance for um, other organisations who are looking to involve young people. Um, and one of the key things we're talking about in that is the really basic things that people often overlook, which is like, is this accessible for young people? Like, is the location of the meeting good? Should it be online? Um, are you paying the young people? Um, it goes back to like, even is the food like young people friendly? Because we don't want to be eating anything really fancy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and there's just, there's so much that goes into it, you know? Um, and it's, it's such a wide ranging and complicated topic, really. I think it's start with what's the minimum level, because I always think of Laura when, <laughs> when, when I get asked this question. Because um, I remember Laura speaking at one of our conferences years and years ago, and she said, tokenism is a start. <laughs> but I think, I mean, this was back in 2017, and I'm, I'm really with Laura on that, because sometimes I think people run away from co-production because they don't think they're going to do it properly. They think it's binary, that either you do it or you don't. Um, whereas co-production is a journey and adults need to learn how to approach ensuring that children's rights to be heard is respected and taken into account. And it's, it's, it's a real, I, I really noticed this through our work, particularly with Scottish government, it's a real journey to take adults on and children and young people take adults on this journey. Um, 
And so tokenism is definitely a starting point because it shows that people are aware of the need to speak to and listen to children and young people. But tokenism isn't the end. It has to be a journey. And so once you've started to engage with children and young people, once you've started to commit to co-production, you have to learn from each other, you have to feedback, you have to create those safe spaces. Um, and that's where ultimately in the end, you will come to what you might see as kind of full and proper um, co-production. Um, so whilst I know when Laura said that back at our conference, a few people were like, oh, really, Laura? Um, I absolutely back her up on that. And I think it's really important that we start somewhere as long as we recognize the failures, as long as when there is tokenism, we say this is tokenistic, this is the beginning of the journey, and we're committed to seeing it the whole way through. As long as you make that commitment, then I think it's okay to have a minimum level at the beginning, as long as you know the goal of where you want to end up. No, yeah, I'd completely agree with that. Tokenism, it's a big issue which we do face in the youth parliament sometimes, um, mainly with like stuff that MSYPs are doing on a grassroots level. But um, it is really encouraging to see other organisations kind of taking that first step, being like, okay, let's involve a young person. Um, even if that is a bit scary, but there's so many, like, Scotland has so many charities which are young people centric, so it's kind of encouraging those organisations who are just beginning this journey to even reach out to them. You know, we have Young Scott, Youth Link, SYP, um, and as long as they keep in mind that the goal of this co-production is to have these young people's opinions influence the outcome of the project so that young people can look at the final product and say, oh, that was the bit that I worked on. This is how I've changed this project. As long as that is kept in mind and that is the final goal, then you really can't go wrong with it. I think you did it for me, Olivia. <laughs> That's what I was going to say to clarify on tokenism. I, I suppose I should say something. Thanks, Juliet. It's, I'm not an advocate of tokenism, <laughs> but what I'm really, what I really want to be clear about is I think sometimes we've created a chill factor where people are afraid to do anything because it's not perfect. And what I, my kind of point is, participation is never perfect. N you never do something and think that's perfect. I would just do it exactly the same way. There, should, there would always you could always have more young people, more diverse children and young people, more time, more whatever. So I think I just want to encourage people to start, you know. And that was where it's from. So tokenism to start, but it depends how you define it. And Olivia did it really well there for me. A lot of people define it as you know it's tokenistic if it's not representative enough or it's not long enough, and that's wrong. It's only tokenistic to me if you don't go in with the right intention, and Olivia defined it really well. And the intention is to do as much as you can with the time and resource you have, learn and get better with young people. What's that better? <laughs> just, just in case anyone gets annoyed at me in the room. And there's a whole article which <laughs> about that. Um, and it was, because uh, I was reminded today in my lunchtime conversation, um, someone who'd read the article, <laughs> I won't put them on the spot, but it was um, what I tried to say is this is a human right and there's no other human right where you would say, I can't give you a good enough education, let's use education, because this is what we're here for today. Just look where education was not good enough. And because I can't do it really well, you're not getting it at all. And yet when it comes to participation, adults sometimes I feel want a wee badge of merit for saying, I wouldn't be tokenistic. And what you're basically saying is I'm denying you a human right and you want me to congratulate you, well, I'm not gonna do that, you know? You have to start and do your best and get better, and then I think young people, in a proper co-production, young people will help you get better. And then one, just one or two other things, like, oh, I have a model of participation, and, and Betty, you captured it really well. The first element of it is about space, and what the right is, it says it, it's to be assured, assured, which is really strong in, in human rights terms. And that means that you don't just wait for young people to come and say, can I, here's my view that there is an absolute active obligation on adults to create the meaningful conditions to go to what was happening to you. They're coming around going, do you want this one? Do you want this one? Do you want this one? And then making it possible for you. And the second thing, the other thing I'm most cited for in the, in the article that I'm known for is this is, the, the, this is not the gift of adults. It's the right of the child, so it has to be voluntary. So my answer to this really, get me back to where I plan to start <laughs> before, is that um, it's not about a level, it's do, do young, have you created the right conditions? 
And it doesn't matter what the level or wherever, it's, is it voluntary? Do young people want to do it? And if they don't, it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter if they're not involved in every bit because it might be t just not interesting to them or boring or just they've, other, they've better things to do at that time, you know? But uh, early's good. Okay, that's not too much. <laughs> but this is my passion. <laughs> So, um, what does it feel like to be part of co-production done well? Yeah, I think um, the, with my work with like Esme Fairburn and the Involving, Involving Young People Collective, um, after like, two, a year and a half to two years of like doing that work, um, me and uh, my colleagues slash friends, um, we made the Involving Young People values, and it's like 10 values for... Um, what it means to have like best practice of like involving young people in like governance, like we are young consultants. Um, and, and like in there, like we have like, we have a framework of 10 things that we think are really important. And like, so the number one is that nothing about us without us. And I know I said this at the start, that's like a term from um, disability justice movement. Um, that is just like, I think to feel the feeling that you get when you're, when you're, in a really good co-production space is that like there is nothing happening like for you without you being in that room or having the opportunity to be there um and then second one's like accessibility like is that space accessible to me actually like if my mum couldn't pay the wi-fi bill next month could they do that for me could they make it possible for me to make sure that like i can turn up and i can show up and like it, for young people that may mean different things like there's like you may have caring responsibilities, um, difficulty in like transport. Uh, could you provide a laptop? I mean, like if you are like giving a thousand pounds, like millions of pounds to charities, uh, um, yeah, then like, yeah, you probably could. <laughs> um, and so like do that. Um, are you like focused on like my training and my development? Like, is this, is this nourishing me as a young person, as well as you as an organization or, or like, is this extractive? And I think that like, in order for it not to be extractive, like I want to feel that, that I'm making connections, that my, my development's being nourished, that, that you are training me in like, in facilitation and in skills that like are transferable beyond this placement. Um, and is it fun? Am I being celebrated? Are you actually like celebrating what it means to be a young person in this space? Is there chances for socialization? Is there a budget for like for socials? And I'm saying like this is like best, 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 right? And it's okay actually if you don't have the budget to do all of these things now. Um, but there's those ways to have fun like without spending money. <laughs> but I think that like to what it feels like to work in um, a co-production co space done well is that like the that you are really there in all the conversations and you can see there's accountability. You can see like what these conversations that we're having, the words that I'm saying, how is this being put to use? Like there's a feedback factor that you are learning. There's a culture of learning in the organization that it feels fun. Um, and that's like all very wordy, but, but like I think that these are also, as well as being like processes and as well as being things that like can put into policy in organizations, it's also about a vibe that you create as well. Um, and I think that that's really important. You just need to have people that are like are really on board, people that really believe in youth voice. And if you have people in an organization that really, really believe in youth voice and really believe that young people um, need to be there, then like a lot of that will, will fall into place. Like a lot of that is about a feeling that it evokes. Um, yeah, what's it for that for you two? <laughs> um, I can't comment on it as a young person because I'm definitely not young, um, but it's making me think of some work that we did last year um, with a group of children and young people um, who named themselves Rights Right Now. Um, and they were from across our member organisations and they were working with us to influence and inform how Scottish government take forward children's rights. So having kind of meetings, high level governance meetings about what they're doing with their strategy, with their action plans, with their participation plans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was all on Zoom, so it was quite difficult to build the relationships that you need to be able to build. Um, and after one of the meetings, we, the children and young people came into the space of the adults in the strategic implementation board and said exactly kind of how they see implementation of children's rights in Scotland, what Scottish government should, priorities should be. And they really, they challenged them on quite a few areas. 
And towards the end of the meeting, the children and young people asked for feedback from the adults in the room, strategic decision makers, about what they thought about their contribution. And one of the adults said, that was nice. And we thought, that is not co-production. Adults who have power, who meet children and young people, who are challenging them on things, it's not nice. It, co-production should be challenging. It should be exciting. It should be fun. It should be inspiring. It should be creative. It shouldn't be nice. Um, so for me, if I'm ever in an environment that's nice, I know that is not co-production done well. If I'm in an environment where I feel challenged, maybe a little bit scared, really inspired, excited, nervous, that to me is a space where I feel that co-production is happening properly, but it's never nice. Yeah, I completely agree with both of you. It's about the vibe. I think as a young person, you know when the co-production is working, just as you know when it's not. You know when it's tokenism, which isn't going anywhere. Um, one of the young people we spoke to when kind of developing these guidelines said that young people are gaining that seat at the table slowly, but now we need to have our voices listened to as well because there are so many adults who do not realise that we are experts in our own lives. And adults kind of, sometimes it does feel like a checkbox activity where they're like, right, we've got the young person at the table, we know what they're going to say, so let's just like leave it. It doesn't really matter. Um, but when... I mean, I mean, we've touched on a lot of it already. You know, it's the decision makers being aware of the possible power imbalances, making sure that it's accessible, making sure that the conversations we're having are constructive and that they're being taken forward, that these young people's opinions aren't just being heard and then they're going like, well, we heard them. Don't need to actually think about it. Um, one of, I mean, one of the examples of this is in our SQA learner panel where we kind of talk about various subjects all to do with exams and the curriculum with the SQA. Um, for all the SQA's faults, they do come back to us and say, this is where we've sent your opinions. This is the person who we're inviting along to say, to kind of hear from you. And that is encouraging, although it's not the most perfect example. Um, but is it, it's encouraging when you can see where these opinions are going and that is when co-production is done well. Yeah, so I've got my researcher hat on again and, you know, we've talked to thousands and thousands of children all over the world about what it's like and, and fun is always up there and trust and patience. I mean, these are really good qualities, but I think for, uh, you made me think, you know, what don't we get out of it? And I think for me, the most exciting moments for me are just you're in a discussion and young people see something in a way you just couldn't have seen it. You just, and it just so makes sense. And I don't know if anybody else can share these. <laughs> you've been in this and then you've just been told something. And of course, of course, it's how a young person would experience it. And you don't see it. And I'm not going to give an example of my own. I have many for my own projects, but there was one that this year I've talked about a lot. Scotland's going to get a barn house, a barn house. You know, which is a you know a place where children who are um, victims or witnesses of crime can go and give their evidence. Really, incredibly important development based on an Icelandic model, and I have done work. They wanted to use the Lundy model to look at Bernhus and how to involve young people, and they're brilliant at listening to individual children. But actually, the Bernhus, uh, the Bernhus, the Bernhus is across Europe had not been developed with young people. Scotland's doing it differently, which is great. And I've been partly involved in that. And there was this example. It was, it was not one of my own, but I want to tell you because it blew my mind away. And it was this. Uh, the Estonian Barnhouse, they realized, Lundy model, they had to involve young people in designing and planning the barn, barn house, And they invited a group of young people to come and co-design this house where children would come to tell their most traumatic stories, okay? Give evidence, you know, once they would get their, you know, their social services support, they get their medical examination, and counselling all happens in this house that looks like a house. It should look like a house. And the day the children went to the Estonian Barna house, the plumbing was broken, and it was stinking. It was smelly. You know, it smelled really, you know, you work it out, okay? And the children started complaining about the smell. So these are the, the children who are co-producing the Barna house. And what they then said was, I got a conversation about smell, 
And we all know children have an incredible sense of smell, don't they? Really fine. Have, have you ever been a parent where some of your children started complaining about the person next, sitting next to you on the bus, you know? Children have a great sense of smell. And they started to sense smells really important to us. And they were like, well, how should the barn house smell? And they were like, let's not talk about the barn house. How should you smell? How should you adults smell? Think about it. And they said, well, what should you smell of? And they said, we, we hate the fact that so many adults wear these strong perfumes and aftershaves. And apart from the fact that it could be a trigger and many of these children are abused, they just said it's really off-putting. And as a result of that, staff in the Barnahus in Estonia, and I think every Barnahus in Europe now who heard the story, wear neutral body products. Okay? And would you think of that? No. And that's those moments, that those moments where we can't know or see or feel or experience what they feel and they tell us, and then you change something. Those are the bits that really do it for me. Yeah. <laughs> so the other thing was, how do you think, the, this is a quiz for everybody, how do you think the Barnahus should smell? They then talked about the house itself. What do they not want to do? I wish I had prizes. Do we have prizes? <laughs> what should a Barnahus, if you were a child coming along to give evidence of a traumatic event, what should it not smell like? What are the two smells children did not want it to smell like? The, the building, the, the place? Exactly, disinfectant. They didn't want to smell like a clinic, that was scary. And they didn't want to smell like a school, because apparently that smells like bad bananas. <laughs> uh, they wanted it to smell like a home, which is exactly what... You, and so what does a home smell like? Cooking, co toast or, co or cookies, yeah? So that's, again, that's... Could we think of that? No. Did any adult in a barn house before think of that? No. And that's why we do co-production. Well, one reason. Any other, anybody else got good examples like that? Because I love those things. <laughs> Where a, a child or young person in, in, in something you were engaged in just told you something. And as soon as there's somebody, can we pass the mic down? Just told you something that, you know, you couldn't have known it until they told you. And of course it makes sense and something had to change. Yeah, sure. This might actually be guessable, but it wasn't one that I'd guessed. It was a big consultation with children. We tried to make it big. It's the Scottish Youth Parliament was much better than ours. <laughs> and uh, we were talking to them about what safety meant. And they very much concentrate, concentrated on their environment, both immediate and wider, and their community. Big thing they said was streetlights. Yeah. They, 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 they spoke about... Um, they did talk about playgrounds and what, what a safe playground environment was. But was also talking about streetlights walking to school by themselves. And uh, we thought safety would perhaps be a bit more interpersonal. They very much spoke about concrete things in their environment. And a, and a number of children spoke about streetlights. That would make them feel safer. Mm -hmm. So it just, uh, it was absolutely concrete. So your, uh, um, right. your example was resonant. Thanks. Any other examples? Of, um, just a few couple. I love these. I collect them. I, I just think it's weird. <laughs> but I think uh, Bruce uh, uh, likes a wee bit dazzling, so I can't see. Can you see? <laughs> Hey, uh, um, when I became uh, Children's Commissioner five and a half years ago, I went around the country and spoke to, to lots of children and young people about what they wanted from, from me in, in the office. And one of the things we talked about was communication. And we made a lot of assumptions that a digital was the way forward, that we'd focus on social media, that we'd fo focus on, on digital. And young people, particularly children, said, no, it's like we, do, we don't want, particularly younger children, aren't even using social media or aren't yeah. digitally engaged anyway. Um, it also plays into digital exclusion. They were saying, no, we want you to come to our communities and we want physical information. We want the leaflets and the posters and things we can hold in our hand. We don't want you to focus online. And then some of the older young people said, where we are engaged on social media, that's our space and we don't want you in it. So don't come into our spaces. <laughs> it's like we're, we're there to, to do the things that we want to do. So, so don't be kind of trying to come into our spaces and turn them into your spaces and communicate in that way. Um, build trusted relationships with us, communicate through those trusted relationships, but actually digital wasn't something they wanted us to focus on, which totally challenged ex all the stuff that we're thinking of. And maybe that's changed a little bit during, during COVID, but I, I was quite struck by that because we'd, we'd moved a lot of our budget towards digital, but actually particularly younger children were saying that's not how we want to engage with you. I'm going to leap in and, and just throw a question that's popped into my head. Um, 
I'm a tiny, tiny charity. There's five of us. Uh, a lot of we don't work directly with um, people sort of like facing it. So one of the things we have to do all the time is build relationships with charities like Include M, who are working directly with you know marginalised communities because obviously nobody, we can't just go in and sort of like start those things going. However. Because we're small, and often those charities are small, what will tend to happen is it will get a champion. And in relation to Include Em, we had a champion in Meg who loved the project from the get-go, um, and he'd happened to pick the phone up to me that day. And I'm not entirely sure, like, I don't know, if somebody else had picked the phone up, because there were other charities in Scotland that I spoke to who weren't interested. Um, and I think, what, what do you, does the panel think about the challenge of trying to expand that Championness, like when one person in an organisation gets it, but then they have to do the work. But what happens when they leave? If they leave that post, like how do you sort of like continue that? What is there any examples that you've seen where organisations have, you know, taken that passion that one person's got and taken it on? I can just like name something that I've seen because like, I've been thinking about this too, right? That like even as a young person in organisations, like you can feel when there's somebody who really, really believes in this and really believes in you, and like you can see your champion basically, and you can also see he's probably not your champion, <laughs> um, and probably needs a little bit more convincing to be in a room with you, um, and just like the I don't know if anyone's heard of like the young trustee movement. Um, but the Young Trustee Movement actually does like a champion training. And so it's like a free one hour Zoom training, which like I recommend everyone does. I did it yesterday. Um, and uh, it's just to kind of like build that championing. It's just like to give you the kind of like the language to describe like why it's so important having young people in governance. Um, and to meet other people who like also want to become champions and um, to build like a little bit of a network there. And I think around that like, 2000 people have done that champion training. And it's like just like spreading that but um, beyond that, I haven't actually seen much. I just thought that was kind of cool. Have you two seen anything? Um, I mean, for me, if you need to carry on that legacy, I feel. I mean, documentaries like this one, they're so eye-opening that when you show that to someone, it almost kind of instantly strikes a chord within them. So it is just a very simple way to put it. But it is, you know, the passion is conveyed through the work and that then translates onto other people and other people tune in with that and they feel that. I know I've had that with so many things. Like before I joined SYP, there were so many issues that I was ignorant to, which I am now so passionate about. And that is just because of the people who have kind of handed the baton on to me, where I've seen what they've done and I've suddenly been like, oh, wait, like I can do that too. And it's so inspiring. Um, so, yeah, it is just kind of making sure that that passion is conveyed through the work. Completely. Um, I think we've got a few examples here in Scotland. Um, I'll start with the unfairties. Um, so this is something that the Children's Parliament has set up. I don't know how many unfairties we've got in this room. And I, oh, we've got quite a few. I'm not wearing my badge, which is appalling. You should have a really cool badge if you're an unfairty. Um, and the idea of being an unfairty is that we understand that it's quite hard to be a children's rights, human rights defender. It's quite hard to be the champion, to be the one who's always always speaking out. So you need that community around you. And it's not specific to your role in your organization. It's intrinsic to who you are. If you're somebody who understands and is passionate about children and young people's rights, it's, it's not a job. It's, it's you, isn't it? And so the Children's Parliament set up the Unfairty Network so that we can all keep in touch. Um, and so that we've all got... Um, that we, know, we know who the unfairties are, we're meant to be wearing our badges. Um, we've got a Facebook page, we've got an e-newsletter, and it's just to provide that support. And what we're looking at as well is actually having unfairty networks. So, um, for example, the other day, then I was giving a presentation to elected members um, who are all going to have responsibility, obviously, for taking forward children's rights under incorporation. And a few of the elected members were just like, oh, it's quite nerve-wracking always being the one who speaks out. And, you know, how do we make sure that we've all got support? So we're setting up a special network for an unfairty network for an elected members. And I think that's absolutely key, just making sure that where there are people who are passionate about children and young people's rights, passionate about co-production, we, we know each other and we keep in touch and we try and spread the word. Um, 
I think another good example is actually Together, um, the organization that I work for, um, because we are a network of organizations, individuals, academics, who are all absolutely committed to embedding children's rights into everything that we do. And so I think being a member of Together, again, means you've got that peer support. We have training events. And it's also a chance, if you've got colleagues who aren't quite as passionate about children's rights as you are, then you just point them in the direction of some of our events and we'll try and capture their imagination. Um, and I think the final example, so just one more, and this is actually specifically about children and young people rather than kind of these adult networks. Um, we have now set up our human rights detectives. And our human rights detectives are aged from, they were 10, but one of them's just had a birthday, 11 to um, 17. They're children and young people from across our memberships. So they've got trusting relationships with their member organizations. And they come together with us to do missions. Um, and these missions are talking to other children and young people about their experiences of their rights, about what's important to them, about what issues they think we should be raising, whether it's with Scottish Government, with the United Nations, or just more publicly with our members. Um, so we've got six detectives, um, and they choose how they want to carry out these missions. So some of them have done missions in their school, others have talked to their friends and their neighbours and their families. Others have set up, a, have got an event coming up in Aberdeen, no, sorry, Inverness, um, with, with a group of children that one of our detectives have brought together. And that, again, is a great way of finding more people children and young people who want to be involved in co-production, who want to be involved in pieces of work like that. So again, it's about spreading the word, spreading the networks. And I think that a number of the children who've been involved in these missions will go on to be um, detectives in the future and take on their own missions themselves. Just one short sentence was given to me by a young person, and, and, and I think it's a really just a really sensible way of capturing it. You know, it, obviously it's really important to have passionate pioneers who demonstrate good practice and convince other people, or not even just convince them, guilt them into trying something is also quite effective at times. But a young person described to me, what you're saying, Laura, is it's everybody's business, isn't it? And that we have to get it across, it's everybody's business. You know, and that, that's the entitlement thing. It's everybody's business. Everyone should be doing it, you know. Okay, so this is our last formal question. And um, after that, if anyone in the audience has a burning question, I'm giving you some time to put it together. But um, what's the most important element to create meaningful co-production? So I've got the mic and I'll start. And of course, <laughs> I mean, some of you know my work and some of you don't, but what I'm known for is a model of participation and there's no one bit. But what I would say is I've spent my last 15 years saying it's space, voice, audience and influence. And it's not one, and you, can't have, you can't just take and do space or voice or audience or influence. And those are my four elements. And together that's, that's for my take on what makes meaningful, meaningful participation. Um, no, I mean, for me to put it into one sentence, um, meaningful co-production is engaging young people from start to finish and then their voices being taken into account with the outcome of the project or whatever it is that they're working on. Um, and it's just making sure that young people are comfortable in that space and they're comfortable with sharing their views and that it's accessible. That is literally the bottom line. Um, and I think it can, like you were saying, it comes across as quite a scary concept for an organisation or a project to take that first step in involving a young person. But all they need is that safe space and that's what you build off of. Completely agree. Again, as always, I'd say the, obviously the Lundy model of... Um, of participation captures everything. And I think combine that with trusting relationships and you've absolutely got it. And those trusting relationships have to be between children and young people, between children and adults, and between the adults themselves. Um, and yeah, take the Lundy model, combine that with really strong relationships and that's it. You can have really strong co-production. say one tiny thing because I did so quickly. I'm so used to doing the Lundy model. Um, one of the things I learned in the Barnahouse project, and it was from working with colleagues here in Scotland, um, particularly Mary Mitchell in the University of Edinburgh, 
And she added that into the model. You know, I defined a safe space as, you know, a safe space as being one where children are not afraid of rebuke or reprisal, and it being an inclusive space. If you know the model, you know that's what I emphasize. But working with Mary on the Barnahus project, we redefined space, and in that we added a relationally safe space as well, because relationships are everything. And when we define relationships that the the type of relationship that defines meaningful participation for me is uh, one of trust. Yeah. I think, like, just to add, I think that, um, I think that, like, none of this is meaningful if, like, I can't see where, like, where my voice is actually being used. Um, and I think that, like, I'd, it's not, it's not necessarily a belief of mine that it's all about outcomes, but I think like with this, it kind of is that like, yeah, you can have a great journey, but like if I can't see that actually like what my, the space for my voice and all this stuff, like if I can't see that all of this is actually amounting to something that I don't want to be a part of it. And I think that's what tokenism is, is that like, it's just like, yeah, you've, you've heard me, but like, are you actually deeply listening? Are you actually willing to put what I say into like fruition, even if it may challenge the structures a little bit, even if it may mean that like, actually this may take a little bit longer because we have to then question these things too. Like I want to see that like that question is happening. Otherwise I just don't, I don't want to do it. Like I don't want to be there just to, just for people to hear some really cool opinions. <laughs> I think that really speaks as well to um, any kind of engagement. Um, I remember, um, I can't, I, and I, even if I could, I probably wouldn't be very good of me to say who it was, but there was a very big organisation who used to do huge amounts of staff surveys. And um, they, they kind of like didn't understand why there was dropping percentages every single time they did a staff survey. And finally, kind of like somebody thought to ask why percentages were dropping every year. And they said, well, look, you know, you asked us like three years ago, you know, we had 75% like response rates. You did nothing that we suggested. And therefore, there's no point. We understand then there's literally no point in kind of like getting involved because you're not going to do anything. So... I completely echo Betty's point about the journey. Yeah, great, but like you have to see some sort of accountability. You have to see some sort of result. Even if it isn't actually, you know, the result you think is going to happen, you still have to show it. You still have to kind of like travel to that space. I just want to, Betty and I agree on a lot of things we found out today, yeah? <laughs> but um, Betty, I got to that journey later after I wrote the Lundy model. I emphasized in influence about feedback and finding out what happened. And about 10 years later, I got really uncomfortable. I've just been involved in so many, so much research, just talking to children where they say they just never found out what happened and they didn't know. And, and that became increasingly frustrating to me, hearing their frustration about this. And I started to think a lot about that space. And then I created this other little model that's now used by the Irish government. And it's a feedback model, it's called the four Fs, and it's exactly that. But my take, like many in the room, I mean, I, I look at everything through the lens of human rights. And human rights is ultimately about accountability, which is the word you just used, Sarah. And I think the feedback is this critical juncture in accountability because it's the point where the decision maker, the adult, you know, often, well, the cover production shouldn't be like that, but in some instances where the decision maker is saying, you told me and this is what I did or didn't do. And children and young people are often getting just really bland responses or no responses at all. So what I've really done is said feedback should be really fast, you know, quick. It should be full, which I'll come back to, and it should be obviously child-friendly language and followed up. And in full, I've created a, a set of questions that if you, if you work with young people and they give you their time, I'm now saying we don't commit to working with anybody unless they promise to respond in detail, to say, you know, what surprised me? What did you do? What are you not doing? Why? What are you doing? When are you doing it? When are you going to do it? And there's a whole set of questions that we ask them to commit to. And that is, it sounds like just, oh, it's another tick box, but it's not. It's ultimately about accountability. And that is crucial from a human rights perspective. Yeah. Just tell them. It's, I think it's transparency, isn't it, as well? And what we've done, I mean, there's a, there's a Leicester City Council in the UK have adopted the model, and they've done incredible work, and I've worked with young people there. And this amazing young woman has defined that, and, you know, she's talked about that element of being. It doesn't matter if you... You're not always going to get what you want, you know, but it's really, really important to know why. If you can't have what you want, it's really important, especially important to know why when you're not getting what you've asked for, as well as when you are, you're not getting it quite there. Yeah. And 
Just very, very quickly. And I think that like what makes me like excited about this is that actually it doesn't matter the journey necessarily that you go on to get this, that actually I really deeply care about youth participation, but like actually maybe the way that the organization is set up right now, maybe like we just need to start with a survey that you send out to young people and like, and like, yeah, that isn't necessarily like having a youth board or a youth trustee, but I don't think we should be putting in young people into places where organizations aren't ready for that, to be honest. Um, and so like maybe it's just about having a survey. And if from that survey, you get really great feedback and, and you act on it, like that is literally doing the work. Like that is it. It's like, it's about taking these outcomes from the voices of like, of young people and people who are affected by, um, yeah, different issues and, and using that and then like yeah that's the springboard to actually now you've shown that your organization actually probably is ready for a little bit of a shake up you are creating more of a culture of like learning and a culture of being open to change and a culture of like being open to like different perspectives and voices and then maybe we could like springboard to like maybe we meet some like consultations maybe we have like a youth advisory board but i don't think that there is necessarily like a dream journey or a dream like structure of the how that happens i think it's just about like actually just like getting voices and getting the outcomes from it and like in a way that suits an organization. Okay, we've got about 10, 15 minutes before we are hopefully getting some coffee, tea and biscuits. Um, has anyone got any questions or comments or examples or anything? Sorry, I'm really rubbish at sitting quietly. I wanted to jump in all the way through there. I feel like I should have talked to you more before. Um, so I, I work with Includem. Um, one of the voices you hear on there is a boy I worked with for a couple of years before he was at a point, a point where he could articulate himself that well. And I think that creating space element, there's also a big lot of time in there because you can't build a relationship straight away. I had to knock on that boy's door every day for, it was more than a year, I think. Then eventually the door opened a little bit. You know, I got things thrown at me, all that kind of stuff until I got to a point where I got him to say, well, why you know, the issues where he wasn't going to school because when he went to school, he was being excluded because he couldn't cope. And I got him to articulate that a bit. I went to the school, I come back, you know, and what he articulated in that two sentences in this film was all of that stuff. And he, I was, you know, so happy, like teary eyed at hearing that voice saying that after all that time. And I think organizations and adults need to acknowledge that it takes a lot of time to build that sort of trust. And a lot of times we don't, we go to young people to ask their views, but we should be listening to their views and acting on them when they bring them up. It should be directed the other way around. That's my part of what I wanted to feed back. Yeah, I love that. And I think just to say as well that like, it's so true that like if you're an organization, like an adult wanting to work with like young people, particularly with, like lived experience of oppression, like if you're working with young excluded people, like these are people who like are at the butt of oppression and also not, not given the space to like voice what that means. And like behind that, like there are gonna be youth workers like you who are like, are facing like shut doors for, for ages in order to do that. And I think that it's like, that's like an accessibility piece that actually also are these young people are there, is there also space for them to be like safeguarded and cared for in this process? If you want people to give opinions on their lived experience of oppression, well then like, there probably should be like therapy after that. And there should be like provisions after that that means that like, that these people aren't just extracted of their, of their like, um, yeah, oppression and like nothing following after that. And I think that, that, yeah, it's like it's never going to be perfect, but I think that it's just like these, like the real cases of like, of course, there are there are youth workers behind the scenes that like haven't access these relationships. So thank you so much for bringing that in. And time is such a big yeah. deal. Do you know what I mean? Like, like it's so invisible. Like, this project, that the, the the film, you know, it took time to film, and part of the reason it took time to film was because of COVID. But it took time to film because I had to find people, and that meant I had to build relationships. So, you know, you had to build a relationship with the young person. I had to build a relationship with different charities, with different organisations, often who are really small, often who have no time to do this kind of thing, and cannot see the point of it. Like, okay, well, there might be a film, what, in three years? years time well you know how's that actually going to speak you know to me and you have to try and f so I mean you know sometimes we get amazing champions but sometimes it's about trying to work out okay what you know we could maybe do a film about your organization you you try and find the exchange points to sort of like you know labor it up but 
explaining how long these relationships take to you know create is a huge i think invisible sort of like aspect has anybody else got I don't know. Oh, there we go. I, yeah, so I'm chair of the Scottish Youth Parliament, and I thought the point that you raised, Betty, about young people in governance positions was a really interesting one. I think I've sat on so many groups that are not made for young people and are not accessible to people outside of the sort of government sp sphere. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting point about when are organisations or groups ready for young people to be in that space. And I've been thinking a lot about young people in board positions recently. Um, and I had a conversation with an MSP the other day talking about an education body being set up in the advisory group for that. I was talking about the fact we have all this time to plan, so why not plan now about how we make that space accessible from the start rather than put a young person in and see what happens. Um, but I think um, I could talk all day about <laughs> being a young person um, on a board, but it was whether any of the panellists have any thoughts about what makes a board space accessible to young people? It's kind of not my expertise because like, I'm not a trustee and I can... But like, yeah, I advise and I think that like, but, but I know that I have sat on boards before and like, they're just so random. Like the people in there just so like, they just say such random things. And, um, and like, I kind of sit there with my face like this, like a lot of the time. And um, I don't really want to contribute because like, I don't think that like, it kind of feels like we're a little bit light years away in like how we think about issues. And like, that's okay, like that's actually fine. But also if you're one or two like people who, who have a perspective like you in a group full of like 20, then of course you don't want to share. And I think that like that boards, there's just a lot of questions that like, I think that should be asked to boards before like young people just like plonked in those spaces. Like, are you willing to like not use jargon? Are you willing to listen? Are you willing to actually like maybe think about the structure of like, of how this board's gonna work? Are you willing to learn like what a pronoun is so that like gender queer people can join this space? Like, are we willing to like actually learn like what the issues are that young people are facing? Um, so that we, there's like some point of connection in um, that room because I think that like young people have to do a lot of learning in order to access the uh, boards and I don't know if like the trustees do that much learning to like to have young people on the boards um, just feels a little bit unfair. Um, yeah so this kind of is my expertise but I ah, I knew that was gonna happen at some point um, but yeah, I do come from a very privileged position though because the Scottish Youth Parliament's board is designed for young people. We only allow young people on the board. Um, so for that reason, um, I haven't really experienced a board where the young person is kind of the young person. You know, we are just, it's almost like a group of best friends running a charity in some aspects. Um, but we are put through quite a vigorous training. Um, the communication is so clear. I know a lot of other boards, you kind of get sent the papers and you turn up and that's it. Sometimes it's less of a meeting and more of a presentation. You just hear how the charity's doing and there's not much else doing. Um, but for us, um, you know, we do so much outside of the just the board meetings. We do stuff like this, um, where we're trying to educate people about how having a young people person involved can be so effective. Um, I don't know, Ellie, you're on the young. Sorry, babes, I'm putting you on the spot. Um, you're on the young Scott board, aren't you? Or what was that like for you? Because I know that is quite a different board in its structure. What was it like for you, kind of settling into that as a young person? Yeah, I think it's really interesting to see how different charities are set up. It was quite eye-opening actually to go from our board, where it's all young people, into that space that. There, it's definitely more adults than there are young people. Um, I think Young Scott, though, are great at making things accessible and like had a meeting with me to see what they could do to support me in that role. And I think it's about, again, having those adults already in those spaces who are advocating for it to be accessible for young people and giving young people the tools to be involved. Um, but I do think that you know we shouldn't be inviting young people into a space that isn't accessible and we should be able to call out when it's not accessible for young people. 
Yeah, definitely. And especially, especially a board setting, it, it can be really stressful. And to throw a young person into that without the adequate support in place can be really damaging. We're quite lucky in SYP where we have like these regular check-ins where the staff members who are absolutely lovely are always like, how are you doing? Do you want to chat? Is there anything you want to go through? So while all the decisions are coming from us, the staff are still there to support us and make sure it is as accessible as possible for us as young people. This is a really difficult question for us to answer. We don't have a young person on Together's board. Um, our trustees are voted in by our members. We have had um, chairs of SYP on our board before, but we don't currently have a young person. Um, we did do a piece of work last year with Rights Right Now and now with the Human Rights Detectives to talk to children and young people about how they want to be involved in our strategic plan and taking forward the direction of the charity. And they said that they weren't really interested in joining the board. They wanted to get involved in our policy, influencing work, work with reporting to the UN, work with the government. Um, and so we put together a funding application for this piece of work about how we involve children and young people in delivering our strategic plan and informing how we deliver our strategic plan. And it was turned down because we don't have a young person on our board. <laughs> so um, we're going around in circles on this one. Um, and it's, it's a constant, constant issue. Um, and so I think if children and young people want to join our board, we would have to make a big change in how our boards run. Um, it's definitely, I don't think it's even adult friendly. And uh, the number of papers that go out, um, I, th I think it would actually probably improve um, the way that we run our board. And it would mean that other board members who at the moment perhaps don't want to speak out about too many papers, too much inaccessible information, it would actually make it better for the adults involved as well. But um, like kind of you both said, at the moment, I don't think it is that space where children and young people would feel able to contribute, want to contribute, be interested in contributing. But I think it is something that we'll continue to look at. Um, and we need to, first of all, get this group together to involve children and young people more in our strategic plan and then take the steps towards um, how we include children and young people in the board meeting. Um, and it's definitely not a case of kind of allocating one place and going, hey, you are a young person, sit on our board. It wouldn't work. We've got a lot that we need to do um, and a lot of work that we need to do with children and young people to make sure that when we do get children and young people on our board, it actually works for everybody. Sounds Betty, there's a new initiative. I, don't, I mean, I'm not recommending it because I don't know enough about it yet. But there's a, and they've set themselves up. They're calling themselves the Child Friendly Governance Project. It's an international initiative, and I'm really curious. They are people who are really concerned about this worldwide, and they're trying to bring in and develop best practice. Um, and they have, they have, they're setting up a board, <laughs> and they're putting young people on it. And my question to them was this: It's not the board. It's not the trustees. It's not. If you, th it's the decisions. You know, it's the decisions, you know, it's and where the decisions are made and which decisions young people want to be involved in or sit through or, you know, and I think if you think of it like that, rather than there has to be some a, child, a young person on the board, it's like, what, where are the major decisions made and which, which ones do young people want to be involved in and then how do we change the way in which young people are informed about those and involved in those? And that's what meaningful participation is to me, isn't it? It's not having a youth trustee, yeah. Oh, sorry, that's it. <laughs> Hi there. Um, even when we're working with a kind of marginalised groups, how do we ensure that it's not only the, the most confident and outspoken that steer the co-production process? I think that's a constant challenge. Um, and it's something... That I think looking at the Lundy model, it's about space and it's recognizing that the space that you create for children and young people to give their views and express their views, have them taken into account, it varies completely depending on the child or young person. And it's something that we've really tried to take into account with our detectives project. Um, we're working with children and young people from all sorts of backgrounds, um, young carers, um, a young boy with learning disabilities. Um, and the space in which they want to participate is, is very different to each other. 
um, and the space in which they want to go out and do their missions and their detective work is very different to each other. And so I think insofar as resources allow, that's the important thing, is talk to children and young people about their space and create a space that's safe for them, safe for their circumstances, and don't think that one size fits all. Even in a small group, it doesn't. Every, every child, every young person is different, and every child and young person needs to tell you what that space looks like for them, for them to get involved. Yeah, I would 100% agree with that. Um, I think the decision maker who is facilitating the space needs to be so aware of the power imbalances because even the most um, comfortable and outspoken young people can still feel intimidated when they're invited into a space and asked to like be an expert in something. Um, and so I would 100% agree. It's about making sure that that space is safe and they're aware that they're not going to be judged. It's just about sharing views because so often adults assume that young people all share the same experience or share the same opinions when in reality we are just as diverse in our opinions as adults are. Um, so yeah, it's about um, making sure that the that we have ground rules in those spaces almost you know in a very practical sense um the projects i work on in my constituency often it is bringing together a really random group of young people from lots of different schools and every session we start off with you know what are our expectations what do we want from each other how do we want to communicate what are we comfortable with what are we uncomfortable with and it's going back to those really basic things that kind of you do at like circle time in primary school just to make sure that the communication is kind of top notch and the decision the people facilitate in the space um understand what could be barriers for these young people yeah, I think that like there's a couple of things. I think that like, when I think about accessibility, that that speaking to a room of people is like not accessible for like a lot of people, right? That it's like especially when there's a power dynamics of like you are here as the young person talking to adults. Um, that's like that can be really really hard, and I found that really hard when I started. And like so, there's thinking about different ways that like young people can feed in. Is there like actually a way that we can ask a question, go into a breakout room with young people, maybe write something? Can I write a song about it if that's actually how I like to communicate instead? Can I actually draw you a picture of like what I what my feelings are? And so there's different like, I guess, ways of like feeding into a conversation. But I think that also um, it's taken me a long time to realize like, like the boundaries of what it means to be a young person in like adult spaces. And I, I say this quite a lot that I feel a little bit like a professional young person that I've kind of like, I've get it now. Like you kind of want somebody who's a little bit rough around the edges, who isn't going to say like what you want them to say. Like it's not going to come out in a polished way and I might not have like a solution, but like here's the problem and like, yeah, deal with it. And like, I, like, I think that I, um, it took me quite a long time to realize that and sadly I'm now phasing out of being a young person just when I think that I've actually nailed that down. Um, but like it has made me thought that actually what would it have meant like if, if I could kind of see what challenge looked like modeled for me um, as a young person that like a lot of organizations want young people to come in with these really, really radical views and to be the innovators and like we're the ones who like think outside the box and out of the system and actually like when you've been schooled in the education system we have, like you're probably not that radical of a thinker, like you're not encouraged to be, especially when you're in rooms of like with organizations of people who look like your teachers or look like your family, like you, these aren't the spaces where you're going to get really, really creative and radical and challenging um, and it takes quite a long time to build the confidence to do that and so what would it look like to actually see challenge modeled or to be given a couple of examples of like just kind of how far you can go just how you can communicate this do I have to put on my like my voice that's a little bit more palatable and or like can I actually just come as my whole self and like bring my experiences and maybe not have a solution maybe not have all the answers but this is my truth like what are you going to do with that um and I think that like yeah it's taken me a long time to kind of of being in these spaces like quite frequently to realize actually just like just how I can show up um and so I think that, like even it sounds counterintuitive but like training young people maybe get young people in who um who have this experience of this to like kind of train young people just to like what does it mean to like show up as yourself like what does it mean to show up in a group of in like in a group of adults and not feel like you have to perform because I think that um 
that I actually don't know any young person that doesn't feel like they have to perform around adults. And it takes quite a long time to take that like performance off and just show up. Um, especially if you're mar marginalized, especially like if you've been told that because of like your blackness, your working classness, your gender, your sexuality, that like that what you say just doesn't matter. Um, and so, yeah, modeling challenge and allowing people to just take off their mask and just become as their full self. How do you follow that? Um, I, I want to give you a really practical example because I think you've touched on like a dilemma for m many, many people. How do we get out to those children who don't normally get involved in the processes? I wouldn't. Ha I couldn't. I couldn't have been these people. I just with the culture and community I came from. I, I would have been sick to stand at a stage like this as a young person. I just wouldn't have had it in me. Um, and, and we need to get to those young people too, not instead of two. We need we need all sorts of young people. And I want to give you a really practical example that came from one of my doctoral students, but not when she was a doctoral student, when she was a teacher, because I'm really, we're here to talk about children who are excluded from school. And she um, became a principal of a school in Northern Ireland that would have a, a really high level of exclusion and social disadvantage. And she came from a grammar school, you know, quite a posh kind of school. She came into the school and she knew it wasn't working, okay? And, it, and she wasn't thinking children's rights. But what she said was, I needed to know, and I didn't need to know from this, just the school council, you know? because the school council were all functioning pretty well. Um, and she did this thing, and I just love it, and I often give it an example, so apologies if you've heard it. <laughs> she went into the um, assembly hall in this school in the middle of rural Northern Ireland, and she gave out two sets of post-its, and she said to the children, young people, students, write down one thing you like about this school, and one post-it, put it in that wall. Write down one thing you really don't like about this school and you'd want to change, put it in that wall, okay? It's cheap, efficient, effective, put everybody out, teachers, teachers not liking it, it became really complicated, anyway, <laughs> as Amy, my former people know what I'm talking about, and then she read, she just sat and read, she read what they liked and she read what they didn't, and one of the things, and it does relate to this, that she read, one of the things that was coming off the wall that the children and young people did not like was setting, in, you know, setting, I don't know what you call it in Scotland, when children are put in ability groupings, they're taken away from their friends and they're thrown into the bottom set. And she read how much this was, and the school thrived on setting. The teachers loved setting. And she just saw this had to change. It was you know, ruining friendships, it was getting people bullied, it was destroying self-esteem. And so that was her thing then. She went in to stop, and that's what her PhD was about. So two sets of post-its, every young person in the school got a chance. And some of them, of course, like drew, like read pictures and stuff, you know, <laughs> and that's okay too, because that's an act. And then I don't know if she's gonna, I'm gonna embarrass her, but the other thing is, she knows I'm gonna do it to her, it, my amazing Amy's at the back, and all of her work is on silence and voice, and actually how silence can be one of the most profound expressions. I don't know if you wanna say anything, Amy. <laughs> no, she doesn't, but anyway. You don't have to. And then we're gonna have some coffee and tea. Okay, then I'll talk. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's really interesting to listen to how do we reach young people who don't, um, who aren't the articulate students who always seem to um, have their say and as they should, but how do we reach the students who might not be quite as articulate? Um, and sometimes I think, well, Maybe we should think about it the other way around. Um, and what I looked at in my um, study supervised by Laura was what do young people not say and how can that tell us about um, their experiences and um, how they feel in a school space, which is where I did my study. And um, it was profound what they said. They used silence as a means of resistance, which is an expression. Um, and they used it as a way of negotiating um, situations where they felt really uncomfortable. Um, and teachers also used silence as a way of negotiating uh, very particular situations often um, came down to authority. And um, young people often would use silence in terms of, I'm not really sure what that adult's agenda is, so I'm just gonna keep quiet until I've sussed them out. And, and they are very, very good at, at establishing what adults want to hear that they are really good at knowing what, what adults want to hear, and they're really good at knowing when some, someone is coming to ask them for their views, and they, they don't feel like they're going to be 
um, have any influence. Um, and so looking at silence, looking at the young people who maybe don't um, articulate their views in the ways, in, in spoken means, um, maybe it's a good idea to, to look at how they might actually be articulating and expressing their views in alternative means, and silence is one of those ways.